Hello, fourth grade, and welcome to unit three, week three. We're going to get started with our vocabulary words. Your first word is the word mistreated. When a person uh, or an animal is mistreated, they're being treated badly by others. So if someone's not treating you kindly or they're not treating you fairly or the right way, you're being mistreated. Your next word is the word fulfill. To fulfill something is to carry it out or to finish it. Like if I fulfill my promise to take you to the park, that means I did it. I took you to the park just like I promised. If I fulfilled my responsibility to do my chores at home before I go out to play, that means I did them. I followed all those steps. I did the things I was supposed to do. Our next word is the word encouragement. When you're offering someone encouragement, you're giving them hope and you're helping them to build their confidence uh, so that they feel good, like they're able to do something. You're encouraging them. Your next word is the word registered. When you register, you're signing up for something officially. So think about when, uh, when you guys are older and you go to college, you register for classes, right? You sign up to take those classes or you might register uh, for an event where you go and you buy tickets. So it's an official enrollment or it's an official sign up to something. Your next word is the word qualified. Someone is qualified if they have all of the abilities that they need to do that job. So someone who went to medical schools and they passed their exams, they are qualified to be a doctor. Someone who went to school and took all their courses to become uh, a teacher are qualified to teach students. So qualified means that you have all the requirements. You already know the things you need to know. You have the things you need to have to do that thing. Your next word is protest. Uh, protest is when you, or when you protest against something, you are rejecting it. You're saying, no, I don't agree. And you're, you're, you're saying it out loud. You're not just thinking it to yourself. So when you protest something, you are, you are being, you're being vocal, right? You're saying out loud that you're against this thing. If it's an idea, if it's uh, regarding people being mistreated, if it's regarding people's rights and you protest, you're saying out loud, your, your, your words and your actions are showing that you don't agree with that thing. Next is the word boycott. A boycott is more than a protest. A boycott is refusing to buy things from a certain uh, person or group of people because you're against something that they're doing or something that they're saying. And your last word is the word injustice. Injustice means a lack of justice or fairness. So something injustice, a synonym for injustice is unfair. When people, people are being treated uh, un unjustly, they're being treated in a way that's not fair towards them. All right, next we have our spelling words for this week. We're going to be focusing on the soft C and the soft G sound. Now, when we're talking about soft C or G, we're talking about when the letter C makes a sound that sound, makes a sound like the letter S or the letter G makes a sound like the letter J. So a soft C or a soft G sound is made when you have the letters E, I, or Y after that C or that G. So if it's C-E, C-I, or C-Y, G-E, G-I, or G-Y, they make that soft sound. Now below we have some of our words. We have the word center, once, seen, spice, circus, cement, police, certain, ounce, glance, germs, bridge, badge, strange, orange, ginger, wedge, Arrange, sponge, village, combs, kneel, wrench, general, and ceremony. Now let's get into our ELA and grammar notes for the week. So we're going to be talking about main verbs and helping verbs, which are called auxiliary verbs. So we've touched on these a little bit in the past, but we're going to go into more depth. So remember, a verb tells you what the subject is or does. So if you're not sure where the verb is, ask yourself, what is the sentence telling me that the subject is or that the subject is doing? And these can be things that you can see 
you know, observable actions, or they might be feelings and things that you can't see. Like uh, they are scared or they were brave, right? Those are not things that you can definitely, you can necessarily see with your eyes. You may see how they're reacting because of it, but uh, you can't see love. You can't see a thought. You can't see fear or bravery. So keep that in mind. I put in some example sentences for you here. I learned bears hibernate in the winter. We made a special presentation. He is a brilliant scientist. They are very happy today. So I bolded the words that are our verbs here. So some of these are main verbs and some of them are helping verbs as well. She thought about her best friend. I worried about the test this week. The grapes tasted so sweet. I love playing checkers with my sister. So all of these are different kinds of verbs. Now helping verbs are also called auxiliary verbs. The word auxiliary means to help. So it's just a synonym for the word help, just sounds a little bit fancier. Helping verbs or auxiliary verbs give more meaning to the verb. So they're telling us more. They show the tense of its past, present, future. They add more emphasis and focus on that verb. Now the three common auxiliary or helping verbs that we're focused on are to be, to have, and to do. Now these have different forms. They can be written in different ways. So be, you can use am, is, are, was, were, and been. Those are all different forms of the verb to be. Different forms of the verb to have was have, has, and had. And for to do, we have do, does, and did. Now, these verbs can either stand alone, they can be um, helping verbs, or they can be verbs by themselves where they're not paired with another one. They're not paired with a main verb. If they are not paired with a main verb, then they're not helping verbs anymore. So if I say, I am having another piece of pizza, am is a helping verb because it's paired with the word having. So if I'm going to have another piece of pizza, have is going to be my main verb. Am over here is going to be my helping verb. She is making dinner for us now. I do not know the answer. I have been running for over an hour. She was given the grand prize. The baby has made a big mess. So you can see that now they're being paired with a verb that comes right after it. A helping verb comes right before your main verb and it gives it more meaning. Now helping verbs also can show us tense, past, present, and future tense. So I split them up for you here on the screen. So past tense, was, were, did, been, and had. All of those are past tense verbs. They help us to recognize that something has already happened. Present ones, present tense of these verbs are is, am, are, does, do, has, and have. They're talking about something that's going on right now. And we also have some that show future tense, and that's anytime we're adding the word will before the verb. So will be, will do, will have, shows us that it's something that's going to happen later on in the future. So remember, a helping verb is paired with a main verb to give it more meaning. Now we do have some verbs that do not show tense. So if we have the verbs can, may, or must, those aren't showing tense. They're just giving emphasis. They're giving you more focus on the main part or on the main verb in that sentence. So I can play tag after I finish my chores. Uh, I may go outside if the rain stops or we must clean our room. It doesn't tell you when something is happening exactly. It doesn't tell you if it's going to happen something that's happening right now or something that's going to happen in the future, uh, but it does provide more emphasis. Now, a few examples of our main verbs showing tense. Now remember, our main verb is the verb by itself, not the helping part, the one that shows the action, the one that tells us what a subject is or does. So if it's past tense, we usually add an ed onto the end of the verb. So walk becomes walked, clean becomes cleaned, and so on. And we do have some words that have an irregular uh, past tense form. So make becomes made, for example, write becomes wrote, run becomes ran, and things like that. So we have some that don't fit that easy rule, but we know the past tense form 
of it to show that it's something that happened in the past. So I made a cake. She wrote a story. He walked to the park. They ran by the beach. We cleaned our mess. Present tense verbs have an S or an ES at the end of the main verb if, um, if it has a singular subject. Or if it's a plural subject, we don't add anything onto the main verb. We just leave the main verb as is. So she walks or he watches, right? Those have an S or ES at the end. But if I'm talking about plural, I say they walk or we sing. Now, remember for main, um, for present tense, we treat a plural subject. And when the subject is I or the, wor the word I or the word you, we also treat it the same way we treat a plural subject. So. I say she walks and he watches, but I say they talk, we sing, I read, you, you know, clean, right? There's nothing added onto the end of it. There's no S or ES. So the only time we add S or ES to make it present tense is when it's a singular subject that is not the word I or you. Now for future tense, we add the word will before the main verb. And this is for sub for singular or plural, it doesn't matter. They will go, we will sleep, she will bake, I will clean, you will uh, sweep, whatever it is. For future tense, we just add the word will before our main verb. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about that we've touched on a little bit in the past are contractions. Now, contractions, remember, are when we combine two words into a smaller word. The first word will almost always stay exactly the same. And the second word is the word that is shortened, right? We take some of the letters out and we replace them with an apostrophe. Now remember, our apostrophe looks just like a comma, but it's up at the top of our letter instead of sitting down on the line. And an apostrophe in, for contractions is used to show that we are uh, substituting that apostrophe. It's, we're putting it in the place of missing letters. Now, if you're adding not to a word, like do not becomes don't. So you can see that the do stays exactly the same. And then not becomes n, instead of being not, it becomes n apostrophe t. So that apostrophe takes the place of the o that we took out. If I have the contraction she will, I will say, I'm going to say she'll. So I'm going to knock off the w and the i and I'm going to replace them with an apostrophe. So she will becomes she apostrophe LL. If I say I am, I'm going to shorten the word am, and I'm going to take the A out of the word am and replace it with an apostrophe. So I am becomes I'm, I apostrophe M. He is becomes he's. So when we're adding is to our first word, that I gets replaced with an apostrophe, and then we keep the S, so H-E apostrophe S. If I'm adding the word R to my first word, so I'm going to take the A out of the word R and, a, and replace it with an apostrophe. So instead of it being A-R-E, it's gonna be apostrophe R-E. So your is going to become Y-O-U apostrophe R-E, and that's the short version of saying you are. Now, if I'm adding the word have, to my first word, I'm going to take off the H-A in have, and I'm going to replace those with an apostrophe. So it's going to become apostrophe V-E instead of H-A-V-E. So they have becomes they've. Now this rule applies when you're adding these words onto any of our other first words. It's the same rule that applies. Not becomes N apostrophe T, will becomes apostrophe L-L, am, becomes apostrophe M, is becomes apostrophe S, R becomes apostrophe RE, and have becomes apostrophe VE. So they have, we have, becomes they've, we've, etc. And the last part of our notes over here, or almost the last part, it's about adding parentheses. Now, in a sentence, you're going to come across some sentences where you have some words that are in the middle of parentheses. Now, we put these, this information, so you add parentheses around the information that's not important to the meaning of the sentence, so nothing's going to change 
your sentence isn't going to um, not make sense anymore if you took it out. So these are parentheses right here. So this half circle looking thing on the on one side and the other half circle on the other side. So it basically is hugging or holding the words that go inside of it. So if I tell you my cat's toy, which is falling apart, needs to be replaced. The main part of my sentence, okay, or sorry, the part of my sentence that's in parentheses, it says, which is falling apart, doesn't actually change the meaning of my sentence if I take it out. It is extra information. So it's giving me more insight into why I need to replace my cat's toy. But if I took it out, if I took it away, my sentence still makes sense. I can say my cat's toy needs to be replaced and I don't lose any of the meaning in it. So parentheses go around the extra bits of information that aren't really important to the meaning of the sentence, but they just give you a little bit of extra background information. So if I say the movie theater was playing Toy Story, my favorite movie. Here again, I don't lose anything if I take out the part that says my favorite movie. The main part of my sentence is explaining that the movie theater is playing Toy Story. Even if I left out everything else, all that information in parentheses, I don't lose any information or I don't lose any meaning from my sentence. Now, for page 64 of your work, and I put this in big letters, there are a lot of corrections that you need to make. Corrections that have to do with adding parentheses, corrections that have to do with contractions. Your sentences usually have more than one correction that needs to be made. So please, please pay very close attention so you don't miss any of those mistakes that need to be corrected. All right, now we're going to get into synonyms and antonyms. So this is something we've covered before, not necessarily new information, but we're going to review it. So synonyms have the same or similar meaning to a word. Antonyms have the opposite meaning of a word. And neither one of them need to be just one word. It can be more than one word to show a synonym or more than one word to show an antonym. So large, big, huge, gigantic, those are all synonyms. Tiny, little, not big, small, synonyms. Children, kids, youngsters are synonyms. Certain and sure. Are you certain of this or are you sure of this? Those are synonyms. Someone who is fearless or not scared or unafraid, those are synonyms. Something that is empty or bare or has nothing inside are also synonyms. Now for antonyms, we have words that are opposite. So happy can be sad or unhappy. Awake could be asleep, top, bottom, opposite meaning words. And our final bit of our ELA notes is going to be about final E syllables. So these are also called VCE syllables. Now, why is it called VCE? VCE, vowel, consonant, silent E. So V is vowel, C is consonant, and E, that little E is a silent E. So these final E syllables or VCE syllables are words where your last syllable in the word has that pattern in it. It has a VCE, a vowel, consonant, and a silent E and they have a long vowel sound because of that silent E. Remember, our silent E makes the vowel before it say its name. So I gave you some example words here of words that have been divided into their syllable parts and they show a final uh, VCE or a final E syllable in them. So the word excuse, we're going to split it after the EX and then C-U-S-E. The U-S-E, that's our vowel, consonant, silent E. The word reptile, R-E-P is our first syllable, rep, and then tile is our final syllable, has a T-I-L-E. I-L-E is our V-C-E vowel right there, or our V-C-E syllable. Invite, same thing. In is the first, con is the first syllable. Vite is the final syllable has that I-T-E in it as well. We have the word describe, the word police and oppose. All of those follow that same rule. So they all have that V-C-E at the very end of it, the vowel, consonant and the silent E. All right, our next part is going to be going over our weekly stories and our first story in our reading, our, sorry, our literature anthology book 
is a biography. Remember, a biography is a story of someone's life that's written by somebody else. So for example, if I wrote the story of your life, that would be a biography. Genre, biography. Essential question, how can one person make a difference? Read how one man became a civil rights leader in his community. Delivering Justice, WW Law and the Fight for Civil Rights by Jim Haskins, illustrated by Benny Andrews. Savannah, Georgia, 1932. The smell of his grandma's biscuits lured Wesley to the kitchen. Wesley was excited because today was Thursday, the day he would see his mother. The rest of the week, she worked for a white family just outside Savannah, cooking, cleaning, and taking care of their children. This was her day off. Grandma's friend, Old John, was sitting at the table. Wesley loved listening to the old man's stories. Old John had been born a slave. He had been taken from his mother and had never known her. He was nine, Wesley's age, when he and all the slaves were freed in 1865. Wesley felt lucky. At least he saw his own mama once a week. Easter Shopping at Levy's once a year, sometime before Easter, Grandma would take Wesley downtown to Levy's department store on Broughton Street to buy one nice outfit. They used a Levy's charge card and then paid a little bit each month. On one shopping trip, the saleswoman would not serve them until after all the white customers had been helped. Wesley had heard the saleswoman politely call the white women customers Miss and Mrs., but she treated his grandma as if she were a child, a nobody. Wesley's grandma pretended not to notice. She was polite, but she was also proud. Come on, she said, it's time to go home. They left the store without buying a thing. Segregation Back then, black people weren't treated as well as white people. Most of the time, they were kept segregated from whites. Wesley went to a separate school for black children. He had to drink from water fountains marked colored. He could not sit and eat at the levee's lunch counter. His Grandma's Prayers Sometimes Wesley got angry that black people were mistreated and that no matter how hard his mother worked, they were still poor. But his grandma was always there to talk with him. She understood why he was upset, but she didn't want him to have bad feelings about himself. She said that no matter how he was treated, he had no excuse not to be somebody. She told him again about the day he was born. She said, I got on my knees and prayed that you would grow up to be a leader of our people. Wesley promised himself that he would fulfill his grandma's prayer. He also promised himself that he would work hard so that one day his mother would not have to work in someone else's house. Voter Schools, 1942 Wesley knew that many black people didn't vote because they had to pass a test to register. The test was designed to be difficult for black folk to pass. It was intended to keep them from voting. Wesley was a member of the Youth Council of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The Youth Council started a special voter school in the basement of a church. With his friend Clifford, Wesley talked to everyone, even passersby, about voting. 
When he found someone who, scared by the test, had never registered to vote, he took them to the voter school. When they felt ready to take the test, Wesley went with them to the courthouse and stayed until they were registered. With Wesley's help and encouragement, many black people in Savannah became registered voters. Working as a Mailman, 1949 After college and the Army, Wesley wanted to be a teacher, but because of his membership in the NAACP, no one in Savannah would hire him. So Wesley became a mailman. The Postal Service hired qualified people regardless of their color. As it turned out, this job suited Wesley just fine. Good morning, Miss Sally Lawrence Jenkins. Wesley sang out to a young woman in her garden. Here's a letter from your sister. Wesley liked to address people by their full names. He could trace a person's history in their name, and history was important to Wesley. If you don't know where you've been, how do you know where you're going? He loved to ask. At the NAACP office, February 1960. After work, Wesley spent long evenings at the NAACP office. One night, he was visited by a group of students who were excited about what was happening in Greensboro, North Carolina. Young black people there had staged a sit-in at a lunch counter in a local store. They had refused to leave until they were served. The students standing in front of Wesley wanted to do the same thing at the department stores on Broughton Street. But they needed a leader. Wesley remembered how his grandma had been treated at Levy's and he agreed to help. But first, the students had to be trained. They had to protest without ever using violence, even if the other side did. If they were attacked and they fought back, Wesley told them, their cause would be lost. NAACP Sit-in Strategy 1. Dress neatly 2. Enter together 3. Sit together Four, order politely. Five, do not react to insults. Six, leave together. Levy's Lunch Counter After weeks of training, small groups of students made their way downtown, entered the big stores along Broughton Street, and sat down at the lunch counters. The stores refused to serve them. At Levy's, the manager called the police, who arrested the students for breaking the city's segregation laws. Throwing down their cards Wesley called a mass meeting the next Sunday at the Bolton Street Baptist Church. People filled the pews and balconies. Wesley opened the meeting with a hymn. All the voices singing together made a thunderous sound, and the mighty noise made people think that perhaps working together, they could really make something happen. Wesley spoke about the arrests of the young people at Levy's. He said that things had to change, and he asked if people were ready to fight for their rights. Someone shouted, I'll never shop at that store again. Then someone in the balcony threw down a Levy's charge card. Soon everyone was tossing charge cards into a big pile in the church. The Boycott Begins, March 17, 1960 The next morning, Wesley led a group downtown. They carried baskets full of charge cards. At Levy's, Wesley and his group dumped the baskets of charge cards onto the sidewalk. Then Wesley announced that no black people would shop at any store on Broughton Street until they were treated equally. The Great Savannah Boycott had begun. Picket Lines Wesley and other members of the NAACP organized a picket line every day in front of Levy's. 
white people yelled and jeered at the protesters and tried to force them off the sidewalk. But day after day, the protesters returned. One day, a large, burly white man punched one of the demonstrators in the face and broke his jaw. But everyone remembered what Wesley had taught them. They didn't yell or fight back, no matter how much they wanted to. Wesley organized other protests. There were kneel-ins at the white churches on Sundays and wade-ins at the all-white beach at Tybee. Wesley wanted to end segregation everywhere in Savannah, in libraries, theaters, public pools, beaches, and restrooms, as well as at lunch counters. Talking about peaceful change. Large meetings were held every Sunday at different churches. Protesters talked about their activities. Some gave fiery speeches. The meetings became so popular that no church was big enough to hold everyone who wanted to get in. For a year and a half, no one from the black community shopped on Broughton Street. Wesley walked down the street and started counting. One, two, three, four, five going out of business signs. The white store owners couldn't stay in business without black customers. When he delivered mail to white people, Wesley told them how much he loved Savannah. He wanted the city to be a better place for everyone. They respected Wesley. They saw how peaceful and committed to change the protesters were. Little by little, more and more white people began to sympathize with the protesters. Desegregation without violence White people in the community who supported Wesley asked what they could do to end segregation and stop the boycott. Together, leaders from the white and black communities worked out a plan. Each evening, after delivering the mail, Wesley organized a group of students to sit in a different kind of business or facility the next day. The theaters would be first, then the restaurants, then the library, and on down the line until every business had been desegregated. Sometimes angry crowds would gather or white people would leave in protest when the black students arrived. But most of the white and black leaders stuck together. The mayor made sure that all the signs marking separate facilities for blacks and whites at City Hall, the courthouse, health department, and hospital were taken down. City officials took the segregation laws off the books. Unlike desegregation efforts in other cities and towns in the South, there was very little violence in Savannah. Justice Delivered on a Sunday in September 1961, Wesley greeted the hundreds of people who arrived at a downtown Savannah church. Inside, their voices joined together to sing out, We are soldiers in God's army. When the song ended, Wesley stood in front of the crowd. He saw his mother sitting in the front row. He saw students who had been arrested. He saw faces beaming with pride. Then he announced in a loud, clear voice, we have triumphed. Savannah was the first southern city in the United States to declare all its citizens equal three years before the Federal Civil Rights Act made all segregation illegal. People both black and white saw Wesley as Savannah's hero. He had kept the protest disciplined and peaceful, even in face of the violence. Modestly, he would say, I was just doing what every black American should be doing. Wesley Wallace Law delivered more than just the mail to the citizens of Savannah. He delivered justice, too. His grandma's prayers had been answered. Stop and Check Summarize How did people in Savannah bring an end to segregation?
All right, that takes us to the end of our first reading. Our next one is an autobiography, and an autobiography is a story that someone wrote about their own life. And this one also talks about the civil rights movement. Genre, autobiography, compare texts. Read how the events of the civil rights era changed a girl's life. Keeping Freedom in the Family, Coming of Age in the Civil Rights Movement by Nora Davis Day. Caption, The Davis Family at a Rally for Peace in New York City. From left to right, Mom, Dad, Laverne, Me, and Guy. Guy made our picket signs. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. As I held on to my father's hand, we joined the line of people chanting and walking back and forth in a picket line in front of Lawrence Hospital. The year was 1965, and the hospital workers needed more money and better working conditions. So there we were on a cold Saturday afternoon to protest. When I looked up, I saw soldiers on the roof of the hospital. I squeezed Daddy's hand a little tighter. The soldiers were there to protect us, he said. We were American citizens, and we had the right to gather and to protest. I raised my picket sign as high as I could. I wasn't afraid. I had Daddy and the American Constitution to protect me. I couldn't wait to get back home to tell my brother and sister, Guy and Laverne, about my day on the picket line. Dinner time was always special at our house. We would sit around the table, filling our mouths with food and our minds with ideas. Mom and Dad encouraged us to talk about anything we wanted to. Anything. Sometimes we talked about our family, about Dad's childhood in segregated Waycross, Georgia, and Mom's love for Harlem, the part of New York City where she grew up. Other times we talked about big ideas, like democracy, freedom, justice, and civil rights. Some days, Mom and Dad weren't home for dinner. They were actors, Ossie Davis and Ruby Dee. But because they were black, they didn't have the same opportunities and rights as other citizens. They decided to use their lives as actors to make a difference. They wanted to make America a place where injustice was not welcome and where Guy, Laverne, and I would always feel like we belonged. And so it was that my ordinary life of chores and homework and hopscotch soon became extraordinary. Every day there were new ideas to talk about at dinner. We learned new words like nonviolence, sit-in, and boycott. Whenever they could, Mom and Dad took us with them to programs, protests, and picket lines. Two years earlier, in 1963, we had moved into our new house and had gotten our first television set, just in time for one of the most important years in American history. We weren't allowed to watch TV during the school week unless something really important was going on, like the March on Washington. When Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous I Have a Dream speech, I wished I could be there with Mom and Dad. I asked myself what kids like me could do to make a difference. Later that year, I had an answer to my question. When four black girls were killed in a church bombing in Alabama, we realized that the fight for change would be hard, long, and dangerous. Mom and Dad encouraged us to think about how we could protest the bombing. Some people said we should boycott Christmas. This was our first Christmas in the new house, and the spirit of giving was important to us. Daddy, at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963, he and Mom were MCs. So instead of boycotting Christmas, our family decided to boycott Christmas shopping. Instead of buying gifts, our family gave the money to civil rights groups. Guy, Laverne, and I gave each other gifts we had made with our own hands. And when the time came to hang the homemade paper holiday chain, I wrote the names of the girls in the last four loops. In our own small way, 
we learned the true meaning of giving. When we gathered for dinner that night, we said a special prayer for the girls and for our country, and I knew that Christmas at the Davis house would never be the same. 1950, Nora Davis is born in New York City. 1959, Nora and Guy meet Judge J. Waddy's Waring, a champion of civil rights. 1962, The Family Marches for Peace in New York City. 1963, The 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama is bombed. 1965, Hospital Workers Picket in Bronxville, New York for 55 days. 1972, Nora votes in her first presidential election. 1985, Nora boycotts U.S. companies doing business in segregated South Africa. 2001, Nora speaks to students at her local high school about social justice. My sister, my brother, and I at the White House in 1995. Mom and Dad got the National Medal of Art. All right, this takes us to the end of our stories in our literature anthology book. We're going to jump into our reading and writing workshop, and we're going to be reading uh, a story called Judy's Appalachia, and this is also a biography. Genre, biography, Judy's Appalachia. A mountaintop is leveled to mine for coal in Appalachia. Judy Bond's six-year-old grandson stood in a creek in West Virginia. He held up a handful of dead fish and asked, What's wrong with these fish? All around him, dead fish floated belly up in the water. That day became a turning point for Judy Bond's. She decided to fight back against the coal mining companies that were poisoning her home. Marfork, West Virginia the daughter of a coal miner, Julia Judy Bonds, was born in Marfork, West Virginia in 1952. The people of Marfork had been coal miners for generations because coal mining provided people with jobs. Coal gave people the energy they needed to light and warm their homes. But Marfork wasn't just a place where coal miners lived. Marfork was home to a leafy green valley, or holler, surrounded by the Appalachian Mountains on every side. Judy's family had lived in Marfork for generations. Judy grew up there swimming and fishing in the river. She raised a daughter there. Mountaintop Removal Mining An energy company came to Marfork in the 1990s. It began a process called Mountaintop Removal Mining. Using dynamite, the company blew off the tops of mountains to get at the large amounts of coal underneath. The process was quicker than the old method of digging for coal underground, but it caused many problems. Whole forests were destroyed. Judy Bonds spoke out against mountaintop removal mining. Dust from the explosions filled the air and settled over the towns. Coal sludge, a mixture of mud, chemicals, and coal dust, got into the creeks and rivers. Pollution from the mountaintop removal mining began making people living in the towns below the mountains sick. In the area where Judy lived, coal sludge flowed into the rivers and streams. People packed up and left. Judy was heartbroken. The land she loved was being mistreated. She realized that the valley that had always been her home had been poisoned. No longer a safe place to live, it had become dangerous. Judy, her daughter, and her grandson had to leave. Working for Change Something had to be done about the pollution. Judy decided it was important to protest against strip mining and demand that it be stopped. She felt that she must try to keep the area safe for people. She felt qualified to talk to groups about the injustice of whole towns being forced to move and mountains and forests being destroyed, all because of strip mining. After all, she had grown up in a mining family. Timeline 
1952, Judy is born in West Virginia. 2001, Judy's family is forced to leave Marfork Hollow. 2003, Judy is awarded the $150,000 Goldman Environmental Prize. 2011, Judy dies at age 59. Judy worked as a volunteer for the Coal River Mountain Watch, a group that fought against mountaintop removal mining. Eventually, she became its executive director. She registered to take part in protests against mining companies. At the protests, Judy faced a lot of anger and insults. Many coal miners were not opposed to mountaintop removal mining. They supported it because they needed the jobs to provide for their families. Judy knew it would be impossible to boycott the mining companies. The coal miners could not afford to leave their jobs. Instead, she pushed for changes to be made to the mining process. Slowly, small changes were made to protect communities and mining areas. In 2003, Judy was awarded the Goldman Environmental Prize for her efforts as an activist. Remembering Judy Sadly, Judy could not fulfill all of her goals. She was diagnosed with cancer and died in January 2011. But her success has provided encouragement to other activists. Judy may not have been able to stay in her home, but her work will help preserve and protect the Appalachian Mountains and help others remain in their homes. Judy Bonds spoke at protests. The Monongahela National Forest in West Virginia. Reread. When you read an informational text, you may come across information and facts that are new to you. As you read Judy's Appalachia, Reread sections of text to make sure you understand and remember the information. Find text evidence. You may not be sure what mountaintop removal mining is. Reread page 195 in Judy's Appalachia. Mountaintop removal mining. An energy company came to Marfork in the 1990s. It began a process called mountaintop removal mining. Using dynamite, the company blew off the tops of mountains to get at the large amounts of coal underneath. The process was quicker than the old method of digging for coal underground, but it caused many problems. Whole forests were destroyed. I read that this kind of mining is a way of getting coal by blowing off the top of a mountain to get to the coal underneath. Author's Point of View Authors have a position or point of view about the topics they write about. Look for details in the text, such as the reasons and evidence the author chooses to present. This will help you to figure out the author's point of view. Find text evidence When I reread the top of page 195, I can look for details that reveal the author's point of view about Judy Bonds. Graphic Organizer Details Judy sees her grandson in a creek surrounded by dead fish. Judy decides to fight the mining companies. They are poisoning her home. Author's Point of View The author admires Judy Bonds for taking a stand against the coal mining companies. Caption. Look at the evidence the author presents. Biography. The selection Judy's Appalachia is a biography. Biography. Is the story of a real person's life written by another person. Usually presents events in chronological order. May include text features. Find text evidence. Judy's Appalachia is a biography. The text describes a real person. The events in Judy's life are presented in chronological order. There are text features. 
text feature, timeline. A timeline is a kind of diagram that shows events in the order in which they took place. Synonyms and antonyms. As you read Judy's Appalachia, you may come across an unfamiliar word. Sometimes the author will use a synonym or an antonym that will help you figure out the meaning of the word. Synonyms are words with similar meanings. Antonyms are words with opposite meanings. Find text evidence. When I read page 197 in Judy's Appalachia, I do not know what the word opposed means. The word supported is in the next sentence. I know that supported means in favor of. This will help me figure out what opposed means. Many coal miners were not opposed to mountaintop removal mining. They supported it because they needed the jobs to provide for their families. All right, that takes us to the end of our language arts notes for this week. If you guys have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I, have, I hope you have a wonderful week. Take care. Bye-bye.